It is September 3rd, 2009, and I'm with Dr. Jack Sarfati, and we're continuing, uh, picking up where we left off in our last conversation a few months ago. Um, but before we go on, Jack wants to correct a numerical error that he made on the last interview. So please yeah, explain. Yeah, when I was talking about uh, under the stress of live performance, and this is uh, live performance art, I suppose, um, I, uh, the uh, dark energy uh, accounts for like 73 of all the stuff in the universe, and the dark matter accounts for about 23%, so the ratio of the two is not 2 to 1, as I mistakenly said, but of course 3 to 1, a little arithmetic, but since I'm a Virgo, a triple Virgo, uh, I'm a stickler for getting the details correct, even if it's a slip of the tongue. So uh, let's continue. Go ahead. Okay, so what? there's been some uh, new developments uh, on the theoretical front since we discussed uh, uh, these your latest work last time. In fact, you're going to Europe to present some papers. Why don't you explain uh, what's happened since then and, and what you're going to be doing in Europe? Well, I'm going to Europe. I, I will be uh, visiting Stockholm, but not for the Nobel, just informally. <laughs> Although I'll, I may be meeting some astronomers uh, there. And then I'll be uh, going in and out of London and uh, I'll be at Trinity College, Cambridge, with uh, Brian Josephson, uh, and uh, ch uh, sort of doing some work at the Cavendish Laboratory, working on my book mainly, and uh, meeting a, a very brilliant young man named Mike Towler, who's uh, uh, giving a course in Bohmian physics at Cambridge, in which he references me and a couple of other things. So uh, uh, th that's what I'll be doing there. and. Uh, then I'll be in Paris, and uh, there's a young filmmaker there who wants to do a documentary, uh, an American uh, filmmaker who's living in Paris, uh, sort of my dinner with Andre type thing. So we'll just be meeting him, hopefully seeing a, an old friend, uh, and I'll be spending a few days in uh, Istanbul, but that's just vacation. So has, has the theory evolved more since we discussed it last? Uh, yeah, the theory is getting more, you know, it, it's getting more and more precise, even mathematically, and uh, well, one reason is that uh, Professor David Kaiser, who's a young uh, professor at MIT Physics Department, uh, a historian of physics, uh, among other things, and uh, he's actually doing a book, a tentative title is How the Hippies Save Physics, about me and Fred Allen Wolf and Dick Herbert, Saul Paul Sarag, and the Is the this 70s. back with the Physics Consciousness Research the Group Physi Physics in the 70s? Physics Consciousness Research Group and all the stuff with the Uri Geller and oh, really? Consciousness and Brian Josephson, that whole kind of story. Uh, but the emphasis on uh, how we were talking about the einstein podolsky rosen effect, quantum entanglement, before people, before it became like mainstream quantum computing theory and how we kind of kept the... Uh, the, uh, yeah, it should be noted, you, you folks were discussing this 20 years before it became mainstream. Yeah, mainstream. 20 years before. I remember when Alan Aspe, you were there, Alan Aspe came to North Beach, San right. Francisco about 1980. And uh, so he's uh, uh, writing a book about that. Uh, and But he gave me, David gave me his uh, PhD thesis, which is now a book about uh, the evolution of the Feynman diagrams, how Richard Feynman made his diagrams that describe quantum electrodynamics, how photons and electrons interact. And that was a great revolution in physics. It's been how it's spread out to uh, fields like condensed matter physics. And, uh, you know, it's, it's totally changed the landscape of the way physicists, theoretical physicists, do their work. But in any case, in reading that book, it uh, gave me a lot of ideas about how to uh, express my own theories in terms of a Feynman diagram. So I'm going back and sort of doing a course in quantum electrodynamics again and uh, reading, uh, reading up on you know, Yang Mills theory and all that kind of stuff and applying it to, to uh, my own work. And one of the things that uh, has become more apparent, although I kind of, well I had this idea back in 1973, in fact uh, Abdus Salam, now, now uh, deceased, uh, Nobel Prize physicist, Pakistani physicist who was uh, head of the uh, UNESCO uh, Institute for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. He invited me to uh, to Trieste back in 1973 because I had been reading his papers and uh, he liked kind of what I did with some of his ideas. And one of the papers I wrote back then, I was uh, then an assistant professor uh, uh, at uh, San Diego State, uh, just actually leaving that position because uh, I wanted to travel. Uh, and but. Uh, I saw, I intuited that there was a, a connection between Einstein's gravitational field and the uh, eightfold way of the 
strong force, the, the, the strong force is the subnuclear, the forces that, the, what called, now it's called gluon, the gluon forces that bind the quarks together to make the, uh, the proton and the neutron and the various mesons, so the whole kind of like high energy nuclear physics and uh, to, up to low energy nuclear physics. And I had a, some feeling like there was a connection. I was trying to find the connection. I wrote a paper, it was published, but uh, 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 yeah, it was, it was too, it was a time, it, it's time and not yet come. But one of the things that are involved there, there was a key data in, in strong, what was called strong interaction physics back in the early 70s called the Reggie trajectories. And what that is, is that when you look at what are called these hadronic resonances, like these excited states of, uh, of uh, hadrons, uh, uh, what happens if you plot the, the spin of these re resonances against the square of the energy, it's a straight line plot, and all the, uh, there are certain families, like different families of hadrons, and they all, when you make these, these Reggie plots, they all lie, they all have the same slope. They're like a bunch of parallel straight lines. And we'll, we'll put a picture of that up. And, uh, and that, it turns out that is the basic data of string theory, of today's string theory. Really? Back then, yes. But back then, the, they had what's called hadronic string theory. Uh, in fact, Lenny Susskind, who went to Cornell with, he was working on it. He was one of the, the creators of that theory. And this was not cosmological strength. No, this, this is, is pre-cosmological. No, this is this is uh, this is microscopic, you know, right. uh, uh, to, uh, nuclear physics, subnuclear uh, nuclear physics, uh, the substructure of the nuclei. Right. So this is the infancy of string theory, really. Infancy of string theory, and uh, and uh, what I noticed was that uh, if you thought of these hadronic resonances as unstable little black holes. In what salon, what in what was a Yukawa gravity? It's a strong short-range gravity. The whole idea there is that what Salam was suggesting is due to a certain spin two meson called the F meson. That effectively you have a strong short-range gravity on the scale of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, the smaller, what's called the the, the Fermi scale, and um, and uh, and and if you have if these hadronic resonances are like little rotating what are called Kerr black holes, even Kerr Newman black holes, where they have charge too, that they have this Reggie trajectory quality to them. And of course now we know that there's a certain kind of duality between black holes and strings, so it all kind of tied in with string theory. So in any case, I noticed that, and uh, I think that's probably what Abdus Salam liked. And that's why he invited me to Trieste. I left San Diego State, went to Trieste for a year, and um, so. Um, uh, this has now come back. Okay, now what has happened uh, most recently since my paper with Creon Levitt was published from the Castiglione Cello conference about a year ago, and that was published now in the uh, proceedings of the uh, European Physical Society, the conference proceedings, uh, I've been able to pin down this relationship back from 1917. It now makes a lot more sense, and I actually have the mathematics of that, how uh, my theory of the emergent gravity how in inflation, what happens in inflation at the, the moment, the alpha point moment of the creation of our observable universe, what we could see with our telescopes back to the, to the Big Bang, what's called the WMAP uh, uh, type data from the, from the NASA satellite, the Wilkins anisotropic microwave, whatever it's called, the WMAP. Uh, how those variations, uh, what the picture is that what happens before our universe is created, we have what's called a false vacuum. And that false vacuum is just a bunch of what zero point wildly fluctuating, totally random zero point fluctuations of, of, of massless fields. Like there's an electron field there, but the electron has no mass. There's, uh, you know, of course, photons never have mass. There are the quarks. The quarks are there, but they have no mass. See, 